Good evening, everybody. Uh, this is Pastor Green. Welcome to our weekly Bible study. We're so elated to have you with us with this uh, this evening as we conclude this fantastic book, the Book of Hebrews. So we're on chapter thirteen tonight. Uh, we'll start with the word of prayer, and then we will proceed. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to stand before your people once again and to uncover the richness of your word. We thank you for this fantastic book. Uh, we pray right now that as we conclude tonight, that the people of God will apprehend from the word of God the genuine treasure that is the book of Hebrews. So we thank you. We praise you, and we ask it all in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Now, as we have gone through this book, we conclude tonight. Chapter 13 is, is the last one, and this book has been very practical. Uh, the first uh, 10 chapters were doctrinal. Uh, actually, the first nine were doctrinal, and the last four have been primarily practical, very practical, and, and this final is just as practical as any that, that uh, the writer has done. We said earlier that we are not absolutely certain that this was the work of the Apostle Paul, but his fingerprints were all over it. And, and as we go through the book, the unique features of the, uh, the epistles to the Hebrews are the warnings throughout the book, and we he, he, in, in chapter 2, he warned the Hebrew believers against the, the danger of drifting from the faith. In chapter 3, uh, a warning of, of departing from the faith. Uh, remember now, the, the Hebrew Christians were under a great deal of pressure because of persecution and what have you from the, from the uh, rest of the Jews over their conversion to Christianity, and they were they were under a great deal of pressure to go back to Judaism. Um, chapter four, there was a, a, the warning against a disobedience, and just like the Israel was in the in the wilderness and they disobeyed. Well, as the uh, Hebrew Christians were developing their faith, they became disobedient. And he was warning them against being disobedient to the faith. Uh, there was a, in chapter five, there was a warning against going dull. You know, sometimes we listen to the word of God uh, often, and uh, some of us have been in church a while, and we go to Bible study, we go to conferences, we do uh, many of the things that we do in church. And after a while, you can you can become dull in your hearing, and they were no exception. Uh, in, in chapter 10, there was a warning against despising what you have learned, uh, despising Jesus Christ, despising the word of God. Uh, you know, you um, look like a Jesus. We're told that Jesus Christ can come back at any time. And there are some folk who will preach uh, all kinds of um, uh, uh, doctrines and not, not necessarily aberrant doctrine, but it may be out of balance. Uh, you know, a few years ago, the prosperity movement had taken hold and it got real popular and uh, the because of the televangelists and these uh, mega ministries, uh, they were preaching the gospel of prosperity and a lot of folk had been in church a long time and they didn't see their bank accounts improving. Uh, they, uh, the prosperity, you might have prospered, but they didn't. So there is a, um, you, you may be under the, uh, the temptation to want to throw in the towel and you can despise the word of God. You can despise what the preacher is talking about because it doesn't look like it's benefiting you. But uh, what uh, the writer to the Hebrews was doing, he gave them a, uh, a warning against it. Don't despise the word. Don't despise the teaching. Uh, even if it looked like it's not taking hold in your life right now, don't despise it. And, and that final warning that we had uh, last week, a, a defiance, a, 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 a warning against defying the word of God. You know, sometimes we uh, listen to the preacher, we think he's preaching directly at us, and because the preacher, we, we take it personal, uh, and we cut our ears off. 
We despise the word. We despise. Um, uh, we despise Jesus Christ. I mean, it's it, you, you cannot despise the word. The word of God is here for our learning, uh, and He gave some prophets and some uh, apostles and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of ministry. And, and the whole idea is for us to be built up in our faith. And that's what the preachers do. That's what the pastors do. That's what the evangelists do. Uh, we're all, the, the, our purpose is to help you get better. And uh, uh, if you don't see your own personal life getting better, or, or sometimes you can just, you know, have hard head children, just defy the preacher, defy the word. And uh, he, he gave this warning against that. And here we are in chapter 13, and it starts out very simple. Very simple. This 13, chapter 13, verse 1, it says, Let brotherly love continue. Very simple. Well, he's giving us instructions, very practical instructions on, on how to live our best life, how to get God's best to happen for you in your life, uh, how to get rid of the th stinking thinking. You want God's best, you do God's best. You want God's best, you apprehend what God is trying to tell you. You receive it and you apply it to your life. Let brotherly love continue. Real simple. Uh, 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 that This shouldn't be, this ain't rocket science. Uh, what you mean by brotherly love? Uh, brotherly love, respect your uh, continue loving each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's just love one another. What's so hard about that? So he tells that brotherly love, uh, uh, you know, it's it's um, it's easy for brothers to love each other. When you recognize that all the believers, you're in this together. So just love each other. Make life real simple. Verse 2, be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Uh, I remember many years ago when um, this was one of the late Pastor Maxwell's favorite verses, and uh, he used that, uh, you know, uh, he did a lot of things for people in his lifetime. Um, he started a, a non-profit to do to uh, uh, house homeless people. Uh, and actually, I, I served on his board of directors when he got the, the Grand Avenue Economic CDC off the ground. This was, oh, about 20 years ago. And um, the, there's a, uh, in fact, the, the Maxwell Tower, Maxwell uh, uh, apartment um, on West Colony Drive, what we did, we converted two motels into SROs. And uh, people who had been homeless were given um, uh, a place to live, clean, affordable housing. And uh, we, we converted two hotels, and uh, they, these things are operating right now to this day. Now, they changed the name of the nonprofit to Pathlight, uh, 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 Pathlight but it's still the same corporation. Uh, it's, um, and when somebody asked Pastor Maxwell, well, why would you want to uh, undergo, do something, that, it took a lot of uh, energy, a lot of time, and he said, look, uh, that's what our duty is. Uh, uh, you have to be careful how you entertain strangers, because sometimes God will send an angel in the form of a, a stranger just to test you. And you have to be careful how you respond to people that you don't know. Well, God knows who they are. If he sends them as a to test you to see if he's going to take you to another level. So if you entertain strangers, you give them that same hospitality that you would give your brothers. He started out, let brotherly love continue. Well, when the strangers come, you don't know who your brother and who's not. So when God sent them to you, he wants you to treat them like, you, like your brother. Verse 3, remember them that are in bonds as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the, in the body. Uh, uh, basically, 
you remember three people who were in prison, in jail? You know, years ago we used to do, uh, and I know some people that do it right now in this day, I haven't done this in a long time, but I really used to enjoy the, the jail ministry. When I first got started doing outreach, the jail ministry, everybody I know that does jail ministry right now get a great deal of, of, of self-satisfaction in doing that because you get the opportunity while somebody's in jail to share the good news and when they get out, I've seen a lot of people get out of prison and turn it, they get saved while they're in prison and then when they get back, get out back into society, their lives are completely changed and oftentimes it is because someone who remembered uh, Hebrews 13 and 3, remember them that are in bonds. You have no idea what kind of impact that you might, might be having uh, in someone's life when you reach out to them when nobody else will, when the society has written them off and you reach out to them and show them some love, the love of Jesus Christ while they're in jail. It, it makes a fantastic, uh, it's a fantastic testimony. And, and when people uh, come around and you see their lives change and it just makes you proud, especially when you, have, you, when you personally have the opportunity to play a part in that, uh, in their recovery. Verse four, this one is simple. Marriage is honorable in all things and the bed undefiled but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. You know, he's, he's, uh, a, he's condemning asceticism, but lust and laxity and, uh, uh, are condemned. He, what he's saying here is sex is to be exercised in the, in the marriage bed and not anywhere else. It, it, uh, God made sex a beautiful thing, a satisfying thing, but it's only to be done in the context of marriage. Uh, real simple. If you're married, don't mess with nobody but your wife. If you're not married, keep yourself pure until you get married. Uh, that's not easy to do in our culture, and that's not even encouraged in our culture. Only in church will you hear that. Only Bible teaching churches and preachers will preach that. Because for the most part, that's not what we do in America. Uh, anybody ever watch TV? That, that's not what we do. We don't encourage celibacy. We don't encourage marital fidelity. Uh, uh, in, in fact, uh, there's a time when everybody want to be a player. We went through that in our society. We have one of the highest, uh, our society has uh, one of the highest uh, out of birth wedlock rates in the world. It, it's just the, the sign of the time, but God has not changed. Uh, uh, God knows that when children are raised in a household with a mother and a father who serve in Jesus Christ, those children have a better chance of becoming children of God themselves. Uh, uh, it's uh, uh, young men who see their father, love their mother, uh, find when they get wives, they treat them the same way. If, if they see their mothers in consecutive relationships, uh, abusing, being abused, uh, a young men have a tendency to be abusive when they, in their own relationship. So uh, uh, when the marriage bed is undefiled, one man, one woman living together, God is well pleased. Now, our society does not emphasize that. But that's scripture. Uh, if, if we go back to what God standard, we're going to see a lower divorce rate. The divorce rate inside the church is just as bad as it is outside the church. And uh, that's because we somehow forget what Hebrews 13 and 4 says. But the marriage is honorable and all. And the marriage bed should be undefiled. Verse 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Now, when I read this scripture, let your conversation, he is not talking about uh, your, your, what you're talking about. 
your conversation, when the scripture says conversation, is talking lifestyle. So you can make your mouth say anything. But conversation, what do people who observe you say about you? What is their conversation about you? So let your conversation is basically your lifestyle. Not the words coming out of your mouth, but the words coming out of other people's mouth about you. What are they saying? Let it be without covetousness. You're not greedy. If someone watch you from a distance and they see you day in and day out and they come away, that's one greedy, covetous person. What the writer here is saying, let that not be said about you. Uh, uh, people who know you casually and they observe you and they come away with the uh, with the their description of you as one of covetousness. Let that not be true about you. That's what he's saying here. Verse six, so that we may boldly say, "The Lord is my helper; for I will not fear what man shall do unto me." Uh, you, you know um, when we. When we live like that, when we don't have to worry about what people are talking about. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Psalm 118, verse 6 says, The Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do unto me? Man can't do anything to harm you. See, when you live upright before men, ain't nothing they can do, ain't nothing they can say. The haters ain't got nothing to say. You live right before men without covetousness. Uh, you're, you're, uh, you're not cheating on your wife and everybody who see you when nobody else is looking. Uh, their honest conversation is, that's a righteous man. Uh, no folk can't agree. you living right, you don't have to worry about how much scrutiny you get. Somebody's spying on you, they're going to come away. If, if you're living right, and they tell the truth, let the truth be told about you. Don't worry about folk talking about you. As long as they tell them the truth. I don't care about you talking about me behind my back. Tell the truth. If you tell, if you tell the truth, my reputation is going to be fine. That's how you want it to be. You see this, and, 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 and when we get here to the seventh verse, he's giving us here the secrets to a happy life. First of all, you need to have faith in God. And secondly, you need to just love people. And that's what these first seven verses tell us. Have faith in God and love God's people. You do that, things kind of work out. You, you, you treat people in a, in a loving manner. You, you live right in front of them in such a way where if they are trying to learn from you what they, what they pick up from observing you, is going to help them. Verse 7. Remember them which have rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. There goes that word conversation again. Remember them that have rule over you. Basically, he's talking about remember the pastors. Consider the pastors, the people that teach you the word of God. See, that's why it's so important for pastors and uh, apostles and prophets and God's workers to live righteous before the people they minister to. Because they're going to pick up from you. If they see you cheat, they're going to cheat. If they if they hear you gossiping, they're gonna gossip. In fact, if they if they observe you living a duplicitous life, they're going to question not only your salvation, but Christianity in general. And we don't want that to happen. We don't want to be the stumbling blocks that cause other people who to uh, uh, to stray away from the path. If anything, we want to be the reason why they hold on. We want to be the reason why they hang in there. We're going to be, we, we want to be the reason that people will continue to hold up the blood stained banner and live out their faith in a, in a way that brings glory and honor to God. So when, so when, and when he says, consider the end of their conversation, you, you, you know, this is, um, uh, consider what their lifestyle 
it's all about. They taught you God's message. And, and, and you remember how they lived and how they died, and you copied their faith. You know, I, I talk about the late Pastor Maxwell all the time because he lived upright in my lifetime. Now, there was a time when he, his younger days, and he used to tell me about it, uh, he got into us a whole bunch of stuff. But from the time he picked up the bloodstained banner, by the time when the time he put his hands to the plow, he didn't look back. And a lot of us, I, I've seen uh, people uh, get saved and start serving God, and uh, they're, if you knew them in their past, you would wonder how did God, why did would God choose them? Well, guess what? Guess who God chooses? He likes imperfect people. See, it's imperfect people he can't do nothing with. That's what was wrong with the Pharisees. Uh, 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 remember when we were going through the, the Gospel of Luke, uh, one of the messages in the Gospel of Luke for sinners only, the sinners are the only ones who can be saved. It's, unless you confess that you're a sinner, you can't be saved. That's what was wrong with the Pharisees. They didn't see themselves as sinners. They didn't see themselves in need of a Savior. So they rejected, rejected Messiah. Well, guess what? Uh, uh, God only saves sinners. So when, when uh, the, the men and women of God that minister to us, remember them. Um, be generous to them. Now, on today's message, I didn't put the cash out emblem on that. I deliberately left it off. If you look on the screen, you don't see it. Usually I put dollar sign green up here. Now, we may flash it at the end, but it's not up there right now. Uh, but the idea is when people minister to you, support the work. Remember them. Remember, consider the end of their conversation. Uh, uh, Why? Look at verse 8. Because Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. He hadn't changed. And Jesus Christ is the same character. He, he, he's not in the same place and performance that he was 2,000 years ago. He's no longer the babe in the manger, but he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. His standards have not changed. Uh, when he said, go ye into all the world and make disciples, that... Um, that uh, uh, marching order has not been rescinded. Verse 9, be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meat, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. Uh, uh, what is he saying here? Uh, don't let all kinds of strange teaching lead you the wrong way. Uh, it's a lot of cults out there. It's a lot of folk that will teach stuff that's just not biblical. Uh, it might be popular, but it's not biblical. Uh, they have you doing stuff that, that's not going to help you, not going to benefit you, not going to benefit the church, and does not bring glory to God. But uh, it might boost some man up. Uh, I'm not going to teach anything that's not, in, that's not scriptural. I mean, y'all have figured that out about me. I preach line upon line, precept upon precept. If it's not in the word of God, I don't say it. It's that simple. And I'm not the only one who preach with integrity. There's a lot of great men and women of God that, that handle the word of God appropriately, and they, they teach what's there. They, when they give you their opinion, they let you know, this is my opinion, this ain't scripture. Paul was the same way. When he gave you his opinion, he said, this ain't, uh, 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 I speak by permission, not by commandment. He'll let you know, someday this is just my opinion. That's what he's saying. Well, you have to be that way. See, believers are, are, are not to be taken away with every new teaching. You, uh, uh, you know, people teaching you that you can't eat certain things. And, uh, and especially with the Jews. Now remember, they come out of a background where they had uh, dietary restrictions. Well, when Jesus Christ came on the scene, the dietary restrictions were no more. If the only thing they had to eat was a ham sandwich, then you had to eat that ham sandwich. See, because the Jews uh, uh, were told that you can't eat pork. Well, if, uh, if that's all there, now God gave them these dietary restrictions, and the dietary restrictions were very helpful during that day because um, there was not 
they did not have refrigeration in those days as we do now. Uh, um, the only way to preserve meat was to do it with, uh, with salt and smoke. Uh, those are not the healthiest ways to preserve. Yeah, uh, you know, I like smoked turkey. I like smoked ham. I like smoked neck bones. Uh, I like smoked fish. Uh, um, uh, I don't like salted jerky. But that's how they did it to preserve it. So, um, you know, you kill something before it rot. Well, if you smoke it or if you salt it, it preserves. That's all, that's, that was the technology of that day. Well, we, we still you do that, but there are better ways to preserve. Refrigeration work, you can freeze stuff now. Well, they couldn't do that back in those days. Uh, if, if they were in a climate where there was a, where there were ice and snow was plentiful year-round, uh, they weren't able to do that. But So the dietary laws are not nearly as important as they were during the Old Testament times. Uh, verse 10, we have an altar where they have no right to eat which deserve, which serve the tabernacle. You see, the, the, there was a comparison between what uh, Israel had under the old covenant and in contrast to the better things of the new covenant. That's the contrast that he's making right here. So don't go back to the Old Testament. You don't need that. That's what he's saying. You don't need that. That's not, you, uh, you are beyond that. Uh, you know, the, the sacrifice that's made now, Jesus Christ made it. We don't have to go back to that Old Testament system of sacrifices. See, the uh, uh, the priest who served the, 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 the holy tent could not eat from the sacrifice that we have. So uh, we, get, we got a whole other uh, system now. And that's what he's talking about. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood and is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest of sin are burned without the camp. You see, the, um, the, the high priest, would, would, they would burn the bodies, they carried the blood into the most holy place, and they would burn the bodies for the sin, and, 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 but, and the, that meat was actually consumed by the people. The priest couldn't have any. They would set some aside for the priest, but the stuff that was, uh, uh, that's how the sacrifice was made. Well, they are no longer under that. They don't have to do it that way. And, um, you know, it, 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 when we say burn, it was consumed. And he's talking about the sin offering. The sin offering represented when the, the, uh, the scapegoat was cast outside the camp. Well, the sin offering was made to appease the wrath of God on behalf of the sinner. So that's why that offering was made. Verse 13. Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. You see, when the scapegoat, the, the sacrificial lamb was consumed, he was uh, uh, the Blood was drained, sprinkled on the mercy seat. The uh, the flesh was consumed with fire, and in the sacrifice, but the scapegoat was sent outside the camp to take away the sin of the people. It was a ceremonial thing. Well, guess what? When Jesus Christ died on the cross. He bore the sin of many, and it was outside the camp. It was not inside the city. It was on the town garbage dump. Uh, the Golgotha's hill, that hill we call Calvary, was not in the city. It was outside the city. It was outside the camp. And that represented the fact that the sin was removed out of the camp. Uh, this, it, it's a ceremonially, uh, the sin of the people was being removed. It was being expiated out of the people into wilderness. And that's where the, the scapegoat was sent off into the wilderness, um, and, and no one know what happened to the scapegoat. Anyway, it, it was ceremonially released into the wilderness. And, and, and what happens, we are to come to Jesus on our way to the heavenly Jerusalem 
and we let him lead us. Okay? Now, when the, the scripture talks about, see, that word Hebrew is one who has crossed over. That's why they were called the Hebrews, one who have crossed over. They crossed over out of the wilderness into the city of God. That's what made them the Hebrews. Verse 15. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. You see, the, the, the sacrifice of the believer, we don't, we don't sacrifice a lamb anymore. The sacrifice we make today is the sacrifice of obedience. Uh, uh, the, the sacrifice of, uh, of good conduct. Uh, the sacrifice of doing good when it don't feel like uh, you know, the sacrifice of praise, praising God. Uh, when we offer the sacrifice of praise to God, we don't need to sacrifice the lamb. Our sacrifice is our praise to God. When we praise God, he, he, uh, he receives the praises. God inherits the praises of the people. When you praise God, it's like that, that sweet smelling savor that the burning flesh from the sacrifice will emanate to God, comes all the way up to heaven. When we, when we are praising God with our lips, that's the reaction that God receives. Praise God. You know, we, we, we like to say that, but that's what we're doing. When we praise God, God... God feels it. God smells it. God, uh, he inhabits the praises of the people. You want to experience God, become a praiser. You want to experience God best, uh, uh, don't be afraid to, 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 to praise the Lord. Praise him. Praise him. Praise him. If you're having a hard time in life, praise him. You are enduring, uh, having to deal with uh, some... Uh, uh, personal uh, uh, challenges. Praise God. Praise God while it, it will, while it look like you need to be crying. Praise God. It'll become a praiser. Let that be the main thing said about you. Man, he sure do praise God. She sure do praise God. Don't be phony with your praise. Be real with your praise. Because God inhabits the praises of your people. You want to experience God? Be a praiser. You want God to, to come into your life and, and move heaven and earth for you? Praise God regularly as part of who you are. But to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifice, God is well pleased. Uh, and when we do that, God is well pleased. Don't forget to do good. And when they say communicate, you know, communicate means to share what you got. When, when, you, when we communicate with the preacher, you know how what that means? Send him some money. That's what you see. When you see the word communicate in scripture, what are you talking about? Be a blessing to the people, the men and women of God that, that have, a, have, have placed deposits, spiritual deposits in your life. I, 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 I don't be I, I don't be ashamed don't be bashful about being generous to the men and women of God that pour into your life that's what the scriptures that's what he's talking about here whenever you see that word communicate do good and communicate forget not but you know it's it's some folks think that the preachers should live like paupers uh, the first thing you hear from the heathen, but well, I ain't finna get them, get them none of my money. Well, if you apply what they're, they're, they're teaching and preaching to your life, you have more. If you get the devil out your finances, you have more. See, the, the folk that got a problem with giving to the ministry, giving to the, 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 the work of the church, these are the folk who. They live ragged lives and don't have nothing to give nowhere. You get the devil out your finances, 
you want to spend all your money on drugs, alcohol, women, and something to smoke, something to drink, or living out above your means, you'll never have anything. Uh, you want to spend all your money on gambling and lottery and uh, a sports book, and um, uh, you're going to stay broke. Uh, those are the folk who are always complaining about um, uh, giving to the work of the ministry. They don't have any to give because the devil got them. But what he's saying here is uh, 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 do good. Be generous to the people of God that minister to you. Be generous to them. I'm not just asking for me. God take good care of me. But if you want God to take care of you, Remember me. Remember the other brethren. Remember the, the, the ministers and uh, uh, prophets and evangelists that uh, ha that ha have, have blessed you, that have deposited a nugget in you that you uh, apprehended, you managed to, 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 to put into practice and you saw, you saw the change come off. You saw prosperity come. Uh, 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 you, you, you started living in the overflow because somebody taught you how to do that. Uh, be generous to them. Look at verse 17. This, they, you know, obey them that have rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your soul as they must give an account that they may do it with joy not with grief. But that is unprofitable for you. You, you know, don't book your pastor. Don't book your preacher. Those that have rule over you spiritually, don't go against their teaching. You know, don't be just be contrary just because you can be contrary. Anybody can be contrary, but you're not going to progress. If somebody preaching and teaching the word of God to you, rightly dividing the word, telling you what thus saith the Lord, telling you the principles of grace, the principles of, of, of God's financial system, if you apply it, you're going to do better. It's as simple as that. Uh, he, I've mentioned this many times before. Uh, uh, this old man, he was he, he, actually younger than I am now, but he was, uh, he was older than me. And he was a, a Christian. This was back in the 70s. And he told me that um, when he got saved, he was making good money back in the 70s. Uh, he told me that when he got saved and started tithing his income, his tithe was less than what he blew in the streets. Uh, I know people make good money right now, but they live raggedy, riotous lives, and they stay broke. And, and I know folk who make less money than them always have some because they live disciplined lives, they live according to scripture, they do what God say do with their money, and they always have some. The folks who make more money but they live undisciplined always beg and always borrowing. Always broke. Uh, they, if you ask them for something, they don't have it because they blew it. Because they live undisciplined lives. Uh, what, what he is saying here in the 17th verse, Obey them that have rule over you. See, God, hey, God requires of the preachers, of the pastors, of the apostles, of the evangelists, those who are teaching and preaching the word of God, God will require us. He's going to make, when we get standing before the Lord, we got to give an account. We have to give an account. And, and, and I know what I'm thinking. I don't want to get before the Lord in that day when I get to stand before the judgment and he say, uh, uh, Green, you, you were slothful in this area. Uh, you, you did not teach your people right. Uh, the people who gave you their ear, you didn't tell them what I told you to tell them. Well, guess what? I'm going to tell you what the Lord told me to tell you. Now, you don't have to obey me, but you do it at your own, you, you disobey at your own peril. You're not obeying me, you obey God. Uh, uh, I know if you do what I tell you, you're going to come out all right. Because God said, I never leave you, nor forsake you. And if we continue to order our steps in the Lord, we do what God say do, God is right there with us. And he's gonna, he is not going to allow his word to, uh, uh, to, to go to return to him void. 
So if we apply the word of God to our lives, our lives are going to come out God. It's just that simple. So te the teaching of the word of God is to be obeyed. And that's really what he is saying. That goes really all the way back to verse 7. Verse 18 now, when we get down into these last verses. Verse 18, he said, pray for us, for we trust, we have a good conscience in all things, willing to live honestly. And I beseech you, the rather to do this, that I may be restored to you sooner. Now, when Paul, I think that's why I mean, this is another one of those things that make me think this was Paul. The, uh, uh, he was in confinement at the time, He's, uh, and uh, he had been away from them. And he, he said, pray that I can, I can come to you sooner. And that verse 20 is a benediction. Uh, now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working with you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Uh, that's a, a benediction. That's his final benediction. And in verse 22, he begins at this final greeting. And I beseech you, brethren, suffer the word of exhortation, for I have written a letter unto you in few words. Uh, suffer the word of exhortation. Um, endure it. Some of this you may not want to hear. It might be a challenge to you, but accept the challenge. You, uh, uh, these these Hebrews uh, had to deal with a great deal of difficulty and, and they were tempted to go back into Judaism and leave Christianity altogether but he says suffer the word of exhortation verse 23 know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty with whom if he comes shortly I will see you salute them that have rule over you and all the saints they of Italy salute you. Grace be with you all. Amen. And, and uh, um, the, uh, Paul dictated this letter. I believe it was Paul. And it was delivered to that church in Jerusalem by Timothy. And this, this, this very practical book, it gives us really a lot of insight it gives us practical instruction on how to live out the Christian life, and doing so is going to make a difference in your life. Uh, doing so is not only going to make a difference in your life, but it will affect the, the lives of the people who are observing you. Uh, this um, this book this has been absolutely fantastic. It's been a great journey. Uh, as I said uh, before, at the end of every one of these um, uh, books, as we go through them line by line, verse by verse. If anybody wants my notes, you're welcome to have them. Just send me a note by you know, email messenger. Give me your email address and I'll download the whole file right to you. Uh, don't just do it just to kind of to do it. Do it and use it to help your own personal Bible study. Uh, we do this so that everyone can be, become better servants of God. Uh, we want to my hope is everyone that listens to me will be better suited to do the same work. Uh, you know, I always uh, really wanted to, to, and I still want to do this, is actually start a school for the preacher. I mean, I was part of one many years ago, and that school shut down. But I would love to, that, that's my goal, really, is to start another seminary right here in Orlando where we can uh, train our uh, preachers and evangelists and pastors and teachers to, to do the work of ministry because there's still a lot of work to be done but the thing is I don't know how much time we got left uh, I mean I wish I, I I wish I was 20 30 years younger with the same mindset but you know with the amount of time I got left I'm gonna keep doing what God said do and you'll see what happens uh, we, we're glad you went along for this ride uh, next week we're going to start on the book of James which is also another very practical book um, gives us just good marching orders, good instruction on how to live 
uh, how to live out our life in such a way where people who are observing us, who are actually learning from our witness, our testimony, would be enhanced because they watched us. You, you know, the best thing you can do is, is uh, live your life in such a way where anybody who is emulating you, somebody is imitating you, they're going to be better. They're going to do better. If you're living your life in such a way that people start imitating you and their lives go raggedy, then you need to check yourself. Father in heaven, I thank you for the opportunity to stand before your people once again. I pray that this, that the, 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 the truth of this fantastic book will resonate, will overcome, they will assimilate, and uh, it, it will become metabolized into their very walk. And that every blessing that you have placed, that you uh, created for us, will be received by your people. I pray that the shackles come off, the blinders come off, and uh, you, you, the people of God will uh, become more prosperous in their own endeavors, and they'll be able to give, they'll be able to, to be more generous to those in need, and they'll just have more to work with and bring glory and honor to your name. So we thank you. We praise you. We ask the Lord to forgive us of our sin and our prayers and our hindrance and let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. We'll see y'all next time. We'll see you Sunday morning at uh, 1015. And uh, next Wednesday night, we're going to start the, uh, uh, the book of James. Uh, we'll see y'all next time.